Good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, um, a publication that puts innovation and digital transformation in context for business. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our two panelists. Um, all the way to my left is Rashik Palmer, Group CEO of the British Computer Society. And Rashik spent 39 years at IBM, where he was VP technology, and also an IBM fellow, which is a pretty big deal considering that the company has only had around um, 310 of them in its 115 year uh, history. Um, and then next to him um, is uh, Vishal um, Chate from Quantum Terra, um, which offers quantum as a service in the areas of quantum algorithms, quantum computing, and quantum security. It's just announced a collaboration with HSBC, um, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later. So we're here to talk about uh, quantum computing, which is a form of computing that taps into the unusual behavior of atomic and subatomic particles to perform far more complex calculations at a massively increased speed compared to today's computers. But we're not going to discuss how quantum works. We're here to discuss how quantum can be put to work for business. So um, with that, I'm going to turn directly um, to you, Ashik, and, and tell us why should business care about this? What can quantum do for business? So look, you know, when you look at um, a, a range of tasks that businesses have today, some of the tasks qu computers today can't solve. They just can't solve them. And, and if you take a really simple thing like, I'm going to try and figure out all the electron states for a, for a caffeine molecule, it would take 44 million years on today's most advanced supercomputer. Um, and, and with enough qubits, 260 or so qubits, we'll be able to do that in a fraction of a second. So that's just one example of many issues that businesses face, which by using quantum, we'll be able to find optimization of, of things in ways that we couldn't do otherwise. OK, so beyond biotech and science, which business sectors are likely to benefit the most and benefit first? And I'll, I'll, I'll ask, start with you. And sure. <coughs> so. You know, when I think about quantum computing and compared to classical computing, it, I, I think you can sometimes compare the power of a quantum computer to a jet plane and the most powerful classical computer to a bicycle. So using exponentially more power, you can solve so many problems in industries from finance to logistics, uh, aerospace, automotive, um, so many parts of our business and society, uh, particularly problems in optimization, machine learning and simulation, can be solved so much better. And really, a lot of the value can be had from problems that we, don't even, we haven't even imagined yet. That's a net new level of possibility. So let's talk about some real world cases. You just a few days ago signed this deal with HSBC. You're working with some other big companies like Talis. Um, t tell us you know, what you can do for those, those industries. Yeah. So um, starting with financial services, right? So uh, for a company like HSBC and other large institutions, um, managing capital, managing your balance sheet is one of the most core functions. Uh, and if you can do that even slightly better, uh, because these, these balance sheets are you know, many hundred billions in size, you can generate a lot of value. So optimizing the complex parameters around that in terms of, for example, seeing how you can most optimally place your assets with other counterparties is a really important uh, task that you can do with someone like HSBC. Um, with someone like Thales in, an, in a slightly different industry, we're working with them to optimize um, Earth observation satellites as they orbit the Earth. So these satellites um, uh, orbit the Earth every eight hours. You give them a route. Uh, they need to find the most optimal route to take the highest resolution images, uh, which can help with you know, weather detection systems and so many other things in society. Okay, so Rashik, let me ask you this. The big joke has always been that quantum computing is only 10 years away, and it's been only 10 years away for decades and decades. But things seem to be speeding up. Um, Absolutely. What's a realistic timeline when, you know, when can we expect this to, you know, full quantum computing to become a reality? And what should companies be doing right now to prepare? Yeah, so w w when you look at 
how quantum has evolved over the last three to four years, it's, um, it's very clear that we're now on the exponential path. We see quantum volume doubling every year. Um, we haven't seen that through the whole of the history of quantum exploration and, and quantum discovery. So, so we are really seeing that happening now. And so as it starts to, um, <coughs> to, really, um, <coughs> um, to, to really start to explode, then we will see the benefits of exponential. Now, is that three years away, five years, uh, 10 years away? I think it's still difficult to predict. Um, but what I can say right now is, wherever businesses see significant uncertainty, Wherever there's a business problem where you have uncertainty, then you will start to see the value of, of bringing quantum algorithms and quantum computing to provide some certainty. So, so, so think about in your business, where is that uncertainty today? Is it uncertainty around customer behavior? Is it uncertainty about using my assets? Is it uncertainty about pathways through my business? Each of those pieces of uncertainty can be made more certain using a quantum computing algorithm. So what should you be doing as a business person today? Quite simply, <clears throat> you've got to be able to play today to prepare for tomorrow. Thank you. Um, and, and, and by using that opportunity to access the range of quantum services out there, because there's, there's many people out there that, that are providing that. IBM's providing that. You're providing that. There's lots of people providing that quantum service. So <clears throat> I would say don't delay. Play today, because you don't know when that algorithm is going to make such a, um, <clears throat> a significant change in the business, it's going to leave everybody else behind. Right? Yes, so we were talking backstage, and basically, you know, the, the trajectory is a bit like just <coughs> with AI. Sorry. You know, people had been working mm -hmm. on AI for decades and decades, and yeah. then suddenly, like, there's this breakthrough, and then Absolutely. it's everywhere. So you go from nothing to everywhere, like overnight. And that's why it's super important that companies start working on it now. So sure. I'd like to go back to you and what Quantum Terra offers, because in the run-up to the time when we have the advantage of full quantum computing, it's possible to do hybrid, where we basically get some of the advantages of quantum by marrying them to today's classical computer systems. So can you talk about you know, how you're doing that? Absolutely. Uh, so as the hardware is, is maturing significantly, there's, uh, there's great innovation happening at the software level as well. So this innovation at the software level allows us to use nearer term devices more effectively. Um, and not only that, um, what we do at TerraQuantum is our quantum software approach is built in such a way that we can use the principles of superposition and entanglement to solve problems, but we construct our software in such a way that it can execute on classical compute today and quantum compute in the near future as well, when it's off enough scale. So by doing that, we harness some of the benefits of quantum computing already today um, to solve problems differently, uh, and that benefit starts to grow as the hardware continues to mature. So we can reap some of the advantages now, but in order to, you know, and that will help companies to prepare for this very different future, but we've got this giant talent shortage. You know, if you think there's a talent shortage in cybersecurity, you haven't seen anything yet, because we don't have people that are qualified to work with quantum computing. So what can we do about that? So, so the first thing is you've got to realize that the ways in you, which you prepare those quantum algorithms is quite different from classical computing. Um, so we've got to start to learn things like quantum mathematics and quantum algorithms. And, and so what we're trying to do with the BCS, for example, and, and Adam should be in the cloud here, for example. Um, Adam is, is, is helping existing IT professionals develop those skills to be able to develop the algorithms and, and start to, to, to be able to you know, get ready for the, those, those things. right? Um, but at the same time, You've got to understand where you want to apply that. So it comes back to, from a business perspective, understanding where the uncertainty exists, where there's going to be maximum return. So understand where the problems are, start to experiment and build some of those skills, and then use it. There's, there's a range of uh, open source quantum programming techniques out there, Qiskit and a whole bunch of others that you can start to use and, and, and practice, because by using them, you'll start to understand the art of the possible, both today and for tomorrow. Because as you said before, it's going to be, there's nothing happening, nothing happening, and all of a sudden, everything is going to be there. 
And it won't be possible to just flip a switch and catch up overnight. So if your competitors are prepared and you're not, you know, yeah. you, you could really risk uh, being wiped out as a business. Um, so the big risk we always hear about in quantum is the fact that it looks poised to break traditional encryption systems. So let me ask you about how you're helping businesses prepare for that future. Yeah, so that's a very important point you make there, Jennifer. I think um, you know, one of the key things to think about is the data shelf life of your organization. Um, health data, for example, uh, it's really important today. Your health data will still be really important to you and to the world in 10 years, 20 years, uh, at a point in the future. So there's this risk that this encrypted data could be stored today and decrypted later in the future. To protect criminals are already doing this. And yeah, that's already happening. Harvest now, decrypt later uh, is, is a very, uh, very important risk to be aware of. And to protect against this, we have a suite of uh, solutions from post-quantum cryptography through to quantum key distribution that can ensure secure communication that is resistant against quantum computers of the future as well. So the message to companies is basically figure out which data you have that's sensitive and that you know, has a long shelf life and then move now to protect it. Absolutely. Okay. And, so and I'd, I'd actually, actually the, the, we're probably too late, by the way, on this because a number of perpetrators have been out there capturing encrypted data and, and stockpiling it ready for when quantum will allow you to unencrypt it. Right? Because what quantum does is it allows you to find large factors very quickly. And it's those large factors that make the crypto algorithms work today. So, so you, know, you really need to lock down your data, make sure it's not being taken by perpetrator, and, and also apply the lattice encryption, the, the, the quantum safe encryption today on, on, on your core data. You've got to do that right now. So we've taught, you know, at, at this particular conference, there's been a lot of talk about um, the um, what, you know, responsible AI and the risks of AI. What about responsible quantum? What, what would that mean? And I'll, I'll ask you to start. Marshall. Yeah, so what, one of the things that we published uh, just a couple of weeks ago was an article called Responsible Computing in the Harvard Business Review. And I'd urge you all to look at that because it starts to set out a set of questions you need to ask yourself um, about the responsible use of computing as its broadest sense. And that includes quantum. So it includes AI, and it's a kind of a superset. So it talks about what does a responsible data center look like? How do we minimize the energy consumption in that data center? What does uh, responsible infrastructure look like in that data center so that we start to make that part of a circular economy and make sure it's being used in an efficient, effective way? How do we think about responsible coding? Right? So the code itself is done in a safe, secure way, an energy efficient way, uh, in a dependable way. And then responsible data use. So making sure it is encrypted in the right way, making sure that it's accessible in it when it needs to be accessible, and only the person that needs to access it has access to it. But it's also inclusive, and we've got transparent algorithms that access it and so on. And, and, and as it goes through, it provides a set of ethical principles. It provides um, you know, guidance for anybody who's using those structures. And I think that framework is applicable to quantum. It's applicable to AI. It's applicable to von Neumann computing. And I would urge everybody to look at that as a, as a foundation for, for, for being responsible with the use of all the computing technology that we have. So um, while we're talking about responsible quantum and responsible AI, um, I, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, and that is the environmental footprint of both of those technologies. Um, right now, you know, AI is using a ton of energy, and it's due to, to use more. Um, quantum also needs a fair amount of energy. What can be done about that? Yeah. So firstly, there'll be an inflection point. There'll be an inflection point where the computational capacity of a quantum computer, that's the hardware that's, that's of enough size and scale, is much more efficient than the energy required to, uh, to, to do that classically. Right? So there'll be an inflection point which is coming uh, quite, quite soon. I think there's a concept bandied around called quantum utility, which includes um, energy com consumption at that point as well. So at, past that point, quantum will be extremely um, much more energy efficient um, for, for, uh, for solving large-scale large problems. But even until we get to that point, it's, it's important to see how we can apply some of those principles to make 
AI of today more efficient as well, how we can compress the parameters, how we can make inference more efficient um, and reduce the overall footprint that's being created out of this. Yesterday, Jack Hittery gave a presentation at the Global Leadership Summit that talked about you know, how we are moving from a world of bits to marrying that world of bits with the world of atoms. So the combination of quantum and AI. What will that bring us? Like, we've already talked, we've hit on some of the advantages of quantum. If you add in AI, what, what are the added benefits for business? What can that do? Yeah, so, so I look at it in three ways, right? The first thing is the use of um, qubits or atoms, whatever you want to call it, will help us simplify and accelerate the learning process in, in AI algorithms. So the, the amount of energy consumption, the complexity of that, um, that process will be significantly reused. And, and we'll also be able to use small amounts of data to be able to do the same kinds of discoveries. So, so that, that's the first piece. The second piece is we'll be able to use quantum algorithms to take where that uncertainty exists in the business and create some certainty. But I think there's a third space as well, which is when we look at processes, human activities, um, any, any, any process we're trying to automate and, and, and make it um, run on its own accord through AI and through programming, there are still breaks in that process. I think, I think the use of, of, of quantum and quantum algorithms will allow us to create more straight through processes. So it will take some activities that we, we fall on a human to do and be able to translate that back into an activity that a quantum algorithm will do for us. Yeah. I want to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I just, just briefly, I think, look, our brains are not binary. Our brains uh, work it, with, with a gradient of voltages uh, between neurons and synapses. Uh, and all the AI work that happens of today is essentially a software construct that's executed on a binary machine. Um, when you move towards quantum computing, that paradigm changes in a way that's closer to how our, ba how our brain actually operates. Um, and what that allows us to do with quantum AI is allows us to have much better learning efficiency, much greater novelty, uh, and much better signal-to-noise ratio detection. So all of this better replicates the intelligence that we do as humans. So we're almost out of time. If you each had one message that you would like the audience to take away from this panel, what would it be? I'll start with you, Rush. But my simple message is don't delay play today, right? You've, you've got access to quantum services on the cloud today. The techniques for building your skills around that exist today. I would start to prepare for that and, and play with it because it's there. Learn, learn what you can do with it. And I would say that uh, we've seen We've seen the change to society that's been impacted by generative AI and the move to cloud computing before that. Um, quantum, in some ways, w will be a combination of both of these. Uh, so this moment will come. Um, as uh, Rashik says, don't delay, play today. It's important for you to be ready so that you're not scrambling uh, and behind your competitors when that paradigm shift happens. So the message is, you know, start experimenting. Start experimenting now. Don't get caught short. Don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, quantum is still some time away. Start training your people. You can, even if you can't find quantum specialists in the market, you can take computer people who have a certain background in math yep. and computer science and train them. Um, and uh, in order to, to, to catch up. Um, but don't forget to get your data quantum safe encrypted now, right? Probably too late, but if you haven't done it, get it done, because this is really, really important. So clean up your data, know what you have, protect it, and, um, and start playing with the technology. Exactly. And with that, I'd like to um, ask the audience to give a nice round of applause for our two panelists. Thank you very much.